Hello, physics students. So, so far, we've been on an incredible intellectual journey. We began in the beginning, as I've said many times, with this goal of understanding the universe, the giant nature of it, from here all the way through outer space to another galaxy, past black holes. So those enormous sizes down to the tiniest sizes, things smaller than the cells in your body, smaller than the atoms, smaller than the protons, that's the goal of physics, and also for all time. From the Big Bang, maybe to the end of time. So that was the goal, and so far at this point, we studied forces, we learned what they were, as well as how to contend with them. We studied motion, uh, how to analyze it mathematically, and then we put it all together with Newton's laws, and we were able to describe so many things, maybe not in all their calculation detail, but at least conceptually with ideas. So we had a sense that we mastered uh, the motion of the universe and how it evolved. And then also we learned about energy conservation and momentum conservation, said the same things as Newton's laws, but allowed us to calculate things and analyze systems with a little bit less effort. So uh, tremendous uh, uh, achievements and the breadth of our understanding. But at this point, what I'm gonna point out is that actually in unit one, we were pretty skimpy with what we learned. And what I mean by that is that what I did not tell you in unit one when we were studying forces is that there are only four forces in all of the universe. Doesn't matter where you are, go to the black hole, there's still only four forces. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, four forces? I could think of force of gravity, normal force, friction force, string tension, centripetal force, I'm up to five, right? Uh, air resistance, on and on, and you could, uh, string tension, I don't know if I said that. So you could go on and list more than four. So what I'm saying is that all the kinds of forces that we learned fall into one of those four categories. And so what we're gonna do is now broaden our understanding of force and get more in detail, more depth the theory, the beautiful nature of the universe, more about force and what it actually truly is. So the first force that we're gonna analyze, we begin today in this video. It's a force we've already talked about. It's called the force of gravity. But what we're gonna do is expand on it. And first we're gonna begin where we under, with the similar kind of analysis that we already have done which said that the force of gravity was just the mass of an object times 9.8, the force of gravity or weight. And that's caused by planet Earth on any object like this mass. And Newton's third law applies. So if this is pulled down with, let's just say 10 Newtons, 9.8 technically is a kilogram. Let's say 10, Earth pulls this down with 10, this pulls the entire Earth up with 10. So that's all true. And then we said in the first unit that that value never changed. Uh, I said briefly it could change with location, but look here. If I see 10 Newtons and then I lift this up, and I can't go that high because of the camera view, but let's suppose I go all the way to the ceiling or all the way to the third floor of the school. As I'm going up, I would still see 10 Newtons. And so on my scale of motion, I would say that the force of gravity is a constant with altitude. And then how about if I move, so up and down, it stays the same. How about if I move sideways? So, okay, oops, board here, over here. It still reads 10, but another point that's equally important is the direction seems not to change. So it's always down in the y direction. It doesn't, it's not like I go over here and then suddenly gravity's sideways. No, it's always down. So whether I move up or sideways, I have the same magnitude, 9.8 times mass, and the same direction. So that's where we begin our studies with that idea. And we're going to see 
that, oops, I messed up my notes a little bit here, that this implies uh, the only way that would be true is if the Earth was flat. So that's where we begin our topic with what I call the flat Earth approximation. I have the room here. You see that when I lift the object up, the force of gravity length doesn't change. When I displace sideways, the direction doesn't change. So FG magnitude, the size, is independent of altitude, and FG direction, hopefully you could read that, is independent of any horizontal displacement, okay? So I'll create a pause, allow you to copy that down. All right, so we're gonna spend about a week believing the Earth is flat. And then we're gonna go on and we're gonna realize, or as you know, point out, I should say, that the Earth is not <laughs> flat, okay? So if I have the globe here, it could, I could explain why I came to such conclusions which are actually false. So I have this mass, and here's New York State, somewhere here, and if I move this from one side of the room to the other, the motion would look like this. Ready? I move, start, and then I moved it. Did you see it move? Of course you didn't, because New York State on this map, the entire state is smaller than how I'm wiggling my fingers. So when I move to one side of the classroom to the other, I don't change much on the scale of the globe. But if I took this mass and I took it over to California, watch what happens. See how that turned? Now, if I go to a big enough horizontal displacement, I see the direction actually changes. And same when I lift up the thickness of the ink on this paper, I don't even know if Mount Everest is as tall as the thickness of the ink on this scale. So when I lifted it up, I didn't lift it like this, I barely moved it. But if I went way into outer space, we would see this scale reading change. So those facts we're gonna learn in part two of the unit, which is uh, gonna come in a week that obviously the Earth is spherical and that these things are actually not true. They're only true by approximation. That's part two of gravity, and then there's a part three of gravity, which is Ein Albert Einstein's contribution, which believe it or not, Albert Einstein, I'll just mention it briefly because it's not part of the curriculum, but maybe I'll sort of light your interest a little bit and you, maybe some of you will go read up on this if you're interested. So Albert Einstein, believe it or not, said there's no such thing as a force of gravity. You might be saying, what are you talking about? That falls. I see it accelerate, and therefore, that is, means there's a force. And if I throw it like this, I see it goes on a curved line path, not a straight line, which would be the path of no force. So what is accelerating this on the curved path? And Albert Einstein would answer the question this way, that this is not accelerating. It is not a curved path. Albert Einstein, everyone knows he's a genius. Albert Einstein says, that's a, that's a straight line. It's not a curved line. You say, what an idiot. I could see. I learned that as a kid. That's a curve. Here's how Albert Einstein explains away this motion. He says that planet Earth warps space and time. It curves space and time, right? What does that even mean, curved space? And how do you curve time? How do you curve space? But that's what he did with his, th with his theory. And then he said that this object doesn't go on a curved path. It goes on a straight line path. This is a straight line path in a curved space and time. He turned it all around. This is a straight line, OK? Amazing theory, not in the curriculum. We're not going to go into it. It's too hard, uh, although there, you could learn a lot about the concepts of it. But anyways, we're going to stick to part one and part two. So I'm kind of getting off track. Let's continue on with the idea that the Earth is flat, force of gravity. So we're going to be studying for this kind of, these facts, the motion of what we call projectile, objects that move 
only under the influence of the force of gravity. And so before we even begin studying these things called projectiles, I want to make sure you understand exactly what a projectile is. So this has got gravity on it, but I'm holding it in my hand. So it's not under the influence of only gravity. I've got to let it go. Then it's a projectile. Or I could throw it up like this. And as soon as it leaves my hand, not while I'm throwing it, but as soon as it leaves my hand, it's only gravity up there. OK? Technically not true. There's always air resistance. So technically, everything we're watching sail through the air is not a projectile. We're going to approximate as a projectile if air resistance is minimal. So what are we talking about? Any rock you throw or ball that's hit like a baseball bat, right? There's air resistance. OK, it's not truly projectile, but in our problems, we pretend the air resistance isn't there, so it's a projectile. A human being could be a projectile. When a diver springs off a board, they go shh, right? And they're in the air or moving through space, only gravity, so they follow that curved path. I put dumb bombs, because I don't know what else to call them, but you know, like the bombs in World War II, when a plane was flying, it just opened some doors underneath, and then all these explosives fell out, and there was no like rocket propulsion on that. It just fell to the ground and exploded. So these things, the motion traces a parabola. What's not a projectile, and it still might be in the sky, like all these, is a rocket or missile, because the rocket or missile has propulsion, right? So that's an extra force besides gravity. An airplane has wings to create lift, so it's not just gravity. A hot air balloon, same thing, got lift. And Smart bombs, that's what they call them. I, I don't know if they still call them that. I remember the news clips in the 90s when they were first bombing things with these bombs that sort of turned and flew and like they, they went around corners. So again, they have fins and wings to make turns, not a projectile. Those are extra forces. All right, so specifically these, we're going to be spending about a week studying them. And based on these two facts, that the force of gravity magnitude doesn't change and the direction doesn't change. There are two facts that are true about the motion of such a thing called a projectile. So let me jot them down, then I will talk about them. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and copy that down and then I'll explain. So, force of gravity is constant, as I said. What does that mean? Newton's second law says the acceleration then must be constant. And as we know, it's negative 9.8. We already knew that, 9.8 in a downward direction. That means the velocity changes by 9.8 meters per second every second. That's fact one, what's happening in the y direction. Let's now look at what's happening in the x direction. Okay, so there it is. Jot it down, and then I'll explain. So, in the x direction, f equals zero. Remember, I moved that around, and then it didn't turn. The gravity was always that way, never this way. So, if there's no force in the x direction, that means there's no acceleration in the x direction. Ax is zero. I added a y here. I, I would like you to do that also. The acceleration in the y is 9.8 and the x is zero. Okay? And the, so that means the velocity in the x direction stays constant. You want to burn these into your head for the next week. We're going to be using them over and over and over. They are the heart of projectile motion. That a projectile, when I throw a baseball like this, is two things happening at once. Acceleration this way constant velocity that way. And a third related fact, I don't even have to state it, but I might as well come out and say it, that the x, the, the y acceleration does not affect the x motion, and the x velocity does not affect the acceleration. And a lot of people have trouble believing that. And you might be saying, I don't, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know who would not believe that. Well, let me give you an example. 
Let's suppose um, I've got a high-powered rifle, like one out of the military that they use for snipers. You know, they shoot people miles away, right? I forgot to look up the velocity of it. I was supposed to look it up before the video, but so I'll make up a, a, a number, just like, a, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe like uh, 3,000 meters per second or something. I don't know, right? Uh, whatever it is, it's very fast, that bullet, when I shoot it. And if I put that in a, in a vice, so it's perfectly level, and I'm in a field that's very, very long and doesn't even rise an inch or go down it. It's perfectly level field. And in that stand, I got that rifle, I pull the trigger. And I, you know, we figure out that the bullet goes like miles away and lands, okay? And we could do it, you know, first trial and we go find the bullet and, and it's a miles and miles away, okay? And then I ask a person, that bullet landed miles and miles away. How long did it take to hit the ground? People say, wow, miles away. It must have taken like three minutes or something to hit the ground. And they are not realizing. I don't care how fast you shoot this, okay? The, what velocity is, the acceleration's always 9.8. So, believe it or not, if at the same time I pull the trigger on that high-powered rifle, I drop another bullet. So one out of the gun, another one dropped. The one dropped hits at the same exact instant, the ground below, as the bullet that landed miles away. Hard to believe. But this is not affected by, it doesn't, it, oh, we're going fast, there's less acceleration. No, it's still 9.8 and it still has the same distance to fall. Now. You might be, like I said, other people, you might be saying, ah, I don't believe that. So I have a little demonstration, and I'm gonna show you, hopefully, to convince you that that is true. But I have to reconfigure the camera, so give me a moment. Now the first time I tried filming this demonstration, it didn't work because the camera angle wasn't right. So here I am on another day. Hopefully today, the demonstration works. Now obviously I'm not gonna shoot a real gun and drop a bullet. What I have instead is this device designed specifically for this purpose. What it is is a shaft that's spring-loaded. I'm gonna pull it back and hitch it on this little hook over here. Then I take two spheres. One of them is hollow. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slip that over the shaft on this side. And the other sphere, which is solid, I'm gonna balance on a little divot over here. And at the start of the demonstration, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this pin up and the shaft will lunge forward. And that does two things at once. One is obviously when it lunges forward, this ball will shoot out hopefully with a perfectly horizontal velocity. At the same exact moment, the shaft slips out of this hole, which makes this one fall down straight down. So I have another one set up over here, ready to go. I'll put this sphere over here, this one over here. What I'm gonna do is pause the camera now because I wanna change the frame rate so it takes the uh, footage at a faster rate. Okay, so we're ready to go. Now the first thing I'm gonna do is release this and play it at regular speed. And what I want you to do is observe that the two spheres hit the floor at the same time. The way you're gonna tell that they hit it at the same time is by listening. If they hit at the same time, you'll hear it'll sound like one click. Whereas if one sphere hits before the other, you'll hear two clicks. So this will happen very fast. So what I'm going to do is say, ready, set, go, and then I'm going to release. Okay, so ready, set, go. Now what I'm going to do is play the action again in slow motion, but I'm also going to pause every few frames. What I want you to do is observe that both spheres are always at the same altitude, in other words, the same distance from the floor. In fact, if you hold a ruler up to the screen, connecting one sphere to the other, you'll always see that the ruler is perfectly horizontal. In other words, the falling 
is not at all affected by the fact that one sphere is projected horizontally in the x-direction. I hope you found that interesting, that the x-velocity is not going to affect the acceleration. This doesn't affect that, but it's also true that the acceleration in the y direction does not affect the x motion. And here's how people might think that, uh, that, uh, that that's not true. So you rewind back to the uh, atomic bomb dropping over Japan when they dropped that bomb. So the plane's going, that was a dumb bomb in a sense. It didn't, it didn't have any propulsion. They just opened it, it fell out, and then it exploded. So a lot of people think that when they drop that bomb, it would fall like this, and the plane keeps going, and the city blows up over here, and the plane's already way over there. And that's, again, thinking, oh, because it's falling, it stops the X motion. This affects that. Not true. The falling does not interrupt the horizontal motion. So, to prove that, I have another little demonstration. So I have to, again, reconfigure the camera. So give me a moment and I'll sh hopefully show you that that's true. Okay, so what I have is a device that holds this little plastic ball at the top of this pole magnetically because the ball has a metal core in it. There are also some circuits in the bottom here and a little sensor and when this sensor is interrupted, it works kind of similar to a photo gate. There's a little piece of metal here that when it passes through this sensor and blocks the beam, it'll release the ball magnetically. Now, if I slowly put that uh, metal uh, into the sensor, you'll see the ball drop straight down. No surprise, things fall straight down. But now what I'm gonna do is push this through. Again, the point is to demonstrate that even though this is falling, the X velocity is maintained. And we're gonna see that proven in two ways. The first is when I play this in regular speed. You'll see that this going through, the, when the ball is released, it doesn't suddenly stop moving this way and go straight down and then land over here when the car is over here. Does not happen. It maintains that same velocity and we'll see it land somewhere over here in the basket, even with the car. Then what I'm gonna do is rewind it and we'll watch it again in slow motion. Furthermore, I'll pause it every, so, uh, every few frame, uh, every, after every few frames advanced, and you'll see that at all times, this ball is directly above the car at all instances. So it's always with the same plane with the car, which is why it falls in the basket. So let's watch it move slowly at regular speed first. All right. So, it landed about here, not over here. Maintain the same X velocity. Now let's watch it happen again with the car moving faster. Horizontally. So maybe before it was 0.2 meters per second, now it'll be like 1.5 meters per second. Ready? Here we go. So, it landed over here, it went further horizontally because it was going faster horizontally. Landed in the basket, again, they maintained the same X velocity at all times. And when we saw it in slow motion, the ball was always directly above the car. Now, the way this applied to the atomic bomb that I mentioned is that the pilots knew that they could not just keep flying at the same velocity after they dropped the bomb, because the plane would be here and the mushroom cloud would have incinerated them. So what they did is when they released the bomb, they knew it would go like this, they quickly turned the plane around as rapidly as they could and flew in the opposite direction so the mushroom cloud and the shock waves didn't destroy them uh, as they were flying. Again, falling does not stop the X motion. The X motion continues throughout, so the principles are truly independent. 
The final thing that I want to do today is to prove that these two facts alone are sufficient to generate that parabolic path that we're familiar with when we launch something in the air. So, this is the example we're going to analyze. A ball launched at 20 meters per second off a cliff that's 122.5 meters tall. So imagine I'm way up high and there's a flat surface below and I throw a ball perfectly horizontally with 20. So what is the motion of that? I'm going to start with the basic equation right off our reference table. D equals VIT plus 1 half AT squared. And I'm going to apply it to both the X direction and the Y direction. In the X direction, I have a V initial of 20, but an acceleration of zero. People say, oh, isn't the acceleration 9.8 when you launch something? Not in the X. In the X, the acceleration is zero. So I put that in there, which makes this part of the formula go away, leaving only this part, 20 times time. And I left the units off just to make it a little clearer. There's the X displacement with tw time. It goes 20 meters every single second, okay? Now, in the Y direction, the same formula. But, notice the VI is zero. I thought it was 20. That's in the X direction. In the Y, there's no velocity. I launched it like this. I didn't launch it like that or like that. So there's no Y velocity. This part of the formula is zero, but there is an acceleration because of gravity acting down. Negative 9.8, this whole formula simplifies to negative 4.9 T squared. And maybe you're already sensing how hard these problems can get because sometimes A is zero, sometimes it's not, sometimes velocity is not zero, and sometimes it is in the same problem. You've got to keep it straight. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reconfigure the camera and show you an Excel file that will take these two formulas and generate parabolic motion. All right, so give me a moment. So here's what we had on the board that you already copied down, but it's a little hard to see here, but this is 20t and this is negative 4.9t squared. I have time increments of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 seconds. So if I plug in 20 times 0 here, I get 0 meters in the x direction after 0 time. One second later though, the object's gone 20 times time or 20 meters. Two, 40 meters, 3, 60 meters, 4, 80 meters, 500 meters, constant velocity. Every second it's advancing by another 20 meters horizontally. In the y direction though, if you plug in negative 4.9 t squared here, what you get is negative 4.9 times 0 squared, which is 0. If I plug in 1 second into this formula, negative 4.9 times 1 squared gives me negative 4.9. Negative 4.9 times 2 squared, punch that on a calculator, get negative 19.6, so on and so forth. Plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 into that formula, and you get these y displacements right here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph these points. At time 0, here is the projectile launched off the cliff. One second later, it goes 20 meters to the side, which is right here on the graph, and down 4.9 meters. So let's see its location at that moment. Let me just... There. There is where the projectile finds itself one second later. At the end of two seconds, it's displaced 40 meters to the side and down a total of 19.6 meters, which is right about there. So let's extend the graph. And there it is at the end of two seconds. At the end of three seconds, it's 60 meters to the side and down 44.1 meters, somewhere around here. So let's see where it is at that moment. Right there. Four seconds later, 80 meters to the side and down 78.4. That point is... right there. And then at the end of five seconds, it's a full 100 meters to the side and a full 122.5 meters down, which is right there. And you see that parabolic path that we see when we launch something, that curved path generated only by D in the X 20 times time 
and d in the y, negative 4.9 times t squared, there it is. But one final thing that I want to add are the velocity vectors for those moments of time. So I prepared that. Let me drag them over. Oops. There they are. And this shows in the horizontal direction, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Constant, advancing by 20 meters every second. And then in the y direction, the velocity is 0, then negative 9.8, then negative 19.6, negative 29.4, negative 39.2, and negative 49 at the impact. Constant this way, increasing acceleration that way. So what I'm going to do is create a pause. Uh, oh, let me move the graph over. And what I want you to do is copy this data table, these values, this graph, and do your best to sketch equal vectors labeled 20 horizontally and increasing vectors with these values over here. So go ahead and do that now. All right, so that is our first uh, exploration of the force of gravity. Uh, flat Earth approximation, constant 9.8 acceleration this way, constant velocity, whatever it is that way, generates parabolic motion. I hope you enjoyed the, the video. I hope you enjoyed the knowledge. I hope you enjoyed the demonstrations. I'll see you in the next physics video.